We are moving rapidly through stuff, and I finally sat down and looked at when the exam is. And uh, so the exam is uh, this Friday, so I guess um, <laughs> it's not? No. The exam is a week from Monday, OK? I'm guessing you guys wouldn't be ready for it this Friday? No. no? There will be, that's right, there will be fewer things on it. Think about that. It will be a smaller, nice, little, tidy exam. And the next one will destroy us. And the next one will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> or you will kill me. I don't know. Are, um, I know your final is cumulative. Is the second exam cumulative? The second exam is not cumulative, no. But the final is cumulative, final yes. Final. Yeah. Okay, so um, I just have a couple fairly minor things I want to say about uh, characterizing proteins. And I do that in recognition of the fact that this is not a biophysics class. So uh, the things that are there really are more biophysical in nature than they are biochemical in nature. But I want you to just be aware of what we can do with certain techniques. So uh, one of the techniques, last time I talked about Malditoff, and Malditoff is a uh, fantastic uh, method. As I, as I say that, I realize I didn't post that figure for you guys. I will get a figure posted showing you the out, um, the um, uh, set up for a Malditoff instrument, and you can hopefully see it better than my words can describe. I will get that posted for you. Uh, but what I want to talk about today are a couple other very powerful uh, techniques that come to us from biophysics. I'm not going into them in any depth, but you should know base, the basics of them, and you should be able to uh, understand why they're useful for us. Um, the two techniques I want to talk about are X-ray crystallography and nuclear magnetic resonance. And you probably had some exposure at least to nuclear magnetic resonance, I'm guessing, in your organic chemistry class. Has anybody had exposure to x-ray crystallography before? A little bit, OK. So um, I'll start with x-ray crystallography. Um, x-ray crystallography, both of these techniques, by the way, are uh, extraordinarily useful for helping us to understand relative positions of nuclei in space, OK? So um, I always tell the story when I give a tour of our uh, facilities um, in uh, ALS, uh, in biochemistry and biophysics to students, that using the tools of um, X-ray crystallography and nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, a biophysicist can determine the position in three-dimensional space of every atom that might exist in an enzyme that has 10,000 or 50,000 atoms. Now, that's a really remarkable thing. Uh, because knowledge about structure leads to understanding about function. We've heard structure function before. When we think about how uh, drugs get designed, the design of drugs is happening increasingly as a result of our molecular knowledge of the structure of the proteins that they're targeting. So if I know the position or I know the structure of the active site of an enzyme, the place where the reaction is catalyzed, I know the dimensions of the molecule that I need to design to plug up that enzyme. And so that knowledge of structure is really valuable for us uh, to uh, have for whatever purpose. And there are purposes besides de de designing drugs um, as well. Well, X-ray crystallography arises from the fact that X-rays um, get diffracted, which basically means they get bent, when they encounter uh, electron clouds. And that diffraction process is uh, depicted here. To do X-ray uh, crystallography, uh, one has to have, first of all, a crystal. And a crystal is a, uh, uh, as you guys see crystals, you don't think about it at the molecular level what a crystal is. A crystal is a perfectly packed homogeneous molecule that has a regular repeat to it. That is, all the molecules in there are of the same composition, and they're organized in a regular fashion. That regular repeat is what gives rise to the crystal itself. And the process of making a crystal for a lot of X-ray crystallographic analyses is actually the thing that takes the longest. Okay, A lot of different, uh, there's no one formula for making a crystal. Different proteins crystallize in different ways. But suffice it to say that making the crystal, which is already shown right here, um, can be a very important uh, and time-consuming step and a frustrating step in the process. Okay? Uh, but once one has a crystal, one can take that crystal and put it in the path of an X-ray beam. And uh, that X-ray beam will, ha will have its rays diffracted again according to the electronic clouds that it encounters. The importance of the regularity of those 
uh, molecules in that crystal are very, very important because those uh, really add up and give us the diffraction patterns uh, that we see. Now, interpreting those diffraction patterns obviously isn't something we're going to do here, but suffice it to say that uh, diffraction gives, uh, this is what a diffraction pattern of a given crystal might look like, and we say, wow, there are some spots. These, are, these spots correspond to places where x-rays got diffracted to. So a biophysicist could take information from a diffraction pattern and work backwards, ultimately, to determine where the individual electron clouds were that caused these pattern, this diffraction pattern to exist. So X-ray crystallography is extraordinarily powerful because it does give us three-dimensional information about the position and orientation of uh, electron clouds, and a, a working map might look something like what you see right here. So here are uh, patterns of electron clouds, and then within there we decide what are the individual atoms that correspond to there. You see different carbons and hydrogens and oxygens uh, and so forth scattered through there. And interpreting these patterns can, again, be a very time-consuming process. It's very computationally intensive, but the result is, at the end of this, that one has that structural information that's very, very useful. Now, uh, again, that's just a very cursory description of X-ray crystallography. X-ray crystallography has its advantages and it has its disadvantages. So the advantage of X-ray crystallography is if you get crystals, then you uh, can really determine these positions very nicely. Sometimes you can't always get crystals, so that's one limitation. And the other is that crystals may or may not correspond to the natural, whatever, that's, whatever that means, shape of the molecule in solution. So we think about enzymes that we have in our cells most of them are dissolved in the water of the cytoplasm. And so when I'm making a crystal, I'm basically taking them out of solution. So one thought is, well, is this reflecting the actual structure it has when it's in solution? So uh, to partly address some of those concerns, um, this additional tech, uh, technology of nuclear magnetic resonance is very useful because nuclear magnetic resonance uh, analysis allows one to um, determine um, uh, molecular structures in aqueous solution. Now, they work in different ways, and, and nuclear magnetic resonance relies on the fact that certain nuclei have uh, spins that are characteristic of them, and those spins can be altered in the uh, presence of an electromagnetic field. So understanding uh, the energies it takes to um, uh, alter those spins of given nuclei, for example, protons, Protons are very commonly used uh, in, uh, in analysis. Uh, to understand the uh, changes in those spins gives us some knowledge about the structure. And I'll just show you a very brief example here. Um, so here's um, a nucleus that has a characteristic spin. There are two possible spins that can exist. One has a slightly higher energy than the other. And the difference between that energy is, what's being, uh, is what is excited using the uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation. Now, it turns out that different nuclei um, have different spins corresponding to the electronic environment in which they find themselves. So this depicts the nuclear magnetic resonance uh, signal um, of a, um, a very simple molecule, this is ethanol, and we can see that ethanol has three different kinds of protons in it. It has methyl protons, okay, that are farthest off on the end. It has the um, the uh, methylene protons in the middle here, and it has hydroxyl uh, on the end. And uh, these give rise to characteristic signals. These signals um, have known positions. We know where hydroxyl protons arise. We know where methyl protons arise, et cetera. And so we can examine the spectrum that comes of this. The spectrum is, is called the chemical shift, which I won't go into, um, and say, okay, well, this, ha this, this molecule has some hydroxyl. It has uh, methylene. It has... Um, uh, methyl uh, protons. Well, as you can imagine, for a molecule like a protein, it's not nearly as simple as this. We might get very complicated spectra. And in fact, we do get very complicated spectra. Okay? So this is uh, a little bit more challenging to interpret. We're not going to do that, obviously, here. But suffice it to say that uh, analysis of nuclear magnetic spectra does allow, ultimately, a scientist to decide which signal corresponds to which groups inside of the protein. Now, um, understanding the different kinds, in this case, of protons that, are, that exist in a, in a uh, protein 
is useful information, but one of the things that we're interested in as biochemists is how do proteins fold? Because remember that folding really gives the proteins its characteristic shape. So we would like to get more information because just the knowledge of what kinds of protons that we have in the protein really isn't sufficient uh, enough for us to tell structure. So one of the techniques that's done with that is a, uh, modify, or a, uh, uh, an enhancement, as, you were, uh, as it were, of uh, nuclear magnetic uh, analysis, and it's called the nuclear overhauser effect. And the nuclear overhauser effect arises from the fact that this click doesn't work. It arises from the fact that nuclei, when they interact with each other, okay, also have uh, effects. So in this case, here are two protons that as a result of folding have been brought into close proximity. And if they're brought into close enough proximity, they actually do affect the signal of the other one. Now this requires a very sophisticated analysis. It's called two-dimensional NMR. And that's obviously a lot more complicated than two-dimensional gel electrophoresis, so I'm not going to go into that. But suffice it to say that with um, this type of an analysis, one generates some even more uh, interesting spectra. But this information that we see here now tells us not only what kinds of protons that we have, but how close those protons are to each other. And that's very, very useful when one goes to trying to determine the overall structure uh, of a protein molecule. So that can be very, very useful. Um, Commonly, these two techniques are used in combination with each other uh, to uh, help elucidate molecular structure. Okay. There's a biophysics course for you in five minutes. How's that? Questions or comments about that? Okay. Well, let's get uh, to, uh, away from biophysics and talk about, this is the lecture I'm going to give today is one of the most popular lectures I give during the entire term. Um, it's the lecture on hemoglobin. And um, hemoglobin is, um, I hope to convince you by the end of the lecture on Friday, one of the most magical molecules in our body. It is absolutely incredible the uh, abilities that are built into the structure of this protein. Well, I start talking not about hemoglobin, but about a related protein called myoglobin. And I introduced myoglobin to you before as a protein related to hemoglobin. It's found in our muscle cells primarily. And there it serves the function of storing oxygen. It's a very good way to store oxygen. Okay? Hemoglobin is very, very good at delivering. That is picking up and dropping off oxygen. The difference you recall structurally, I hope, between the two proteins is that myoglobin has a single protein subunit. And hemoglobin has four protein subunits. So hemoglobin has quaternary structure. Myoglobin does not. Okay. And uh, this quaternary structure that uh, myoglobin has is, uh, that, that hemoglobin has, uh, is what gives rise to all of the properties that the, that the molecule has. Well, you've seen myoglobin once before. Myoglobin is mostly alpha helical structures. It looks something like this. There's the amino terminus, and there's the carboxyl terminus. And we see we have alpha helix bend, alpha helix bend, alpha helix bend. A lot of alpha helices in there. We see uh, the amino acids. We see 146 uh, amino acids. Um, myoglobin was... Um, I believe the first uh, protein whose um, structure of this nature was actually determined. And um, so that has some biochemical significance, not, not of any concern to us for the moment. But the other concern for us is it has a, an oxygen binding group in it called a heme. So the heme, and yes, myoglobin has heme just as hemoglobin has heme. The heme is located right here. Yes, sir. So is this myoglobin, or is this the beta chain of hemoglobin, or are they just... Oh, actually, I'm sorry. This is the beta chain. <laughs> I'm not even reading my own, my own figure. I have a link to it that says myoglobin. They're very, very similar. So, but this is the beta chain of hemoglobin. But we can think of this as myoglobin, because as I say, the structure is very, very similar between the two. Yeah, thanks for noticing that. All right, anyway, both myoglobin and hemoglobin have a heme. Hemoglobin, you recall, has four chains, two called beta and two called alpha. This is one of the, the betas right here. Now, the heme turns out to be really important uh, for several reasons. The number one being, of course, that it's the place where the oxygen is bound by this protein subunit. Okay. Now, um, there's the heme. Uh, heme is a flat ring. 
It is something we refer to in these proteins as a prosthetic group. Sounds like a very mouthful of a name, a prosthetic group. A prosthetic group is simply uh, a molecule bound to a protein that helps the protein to do what it does. It's a, not, it's a non-amino acid. So it's a non-amino acid bound to a protein that helps the protein to function. Hem, uh, the heme group of hemoglobin is, uh, and myoglobin, are, the, the two are essentially identical. And uh, they're very, very similar in structure uh, to uh, chlorophyll, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the electron gathering component of chlorophyll that we find in plants. Okay? The difference in plants is that instead of having an iron in the middle, we have a magnesium in the middle. Yes, Shannon? So um, this, this is, you said this is planar? It's planar. It has like 20 carbons mm -hmm. and stuff in the middle. How is it possible? How is it possible? Yeah. Well, uh, if we're talking about an exact plane, there's nothing that's exactly flat. But in, in, in general, it's a flat structure. And you're going to see from what I talked to you about this that there are places where it actually puckers. So it's planar, but I wouldn't say it's a perfect plane, no. Is that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, that puckering that we will see is very, very uh, important. Uh, it's actually seen right here in this figure. So. Uh, what I'm getting ready to tell you about here occurs in both myoglobin and hemoglobin. But the impact is felt in hemoglobin because of its four subunits. All right? So this, what you see happening on the screen happens in both proteins. Let me describe to you what's, what's going on here. If we look at the um, deoxyhemoglobin on the left, that's the way it normally sits. Shannon says, well, that's not exactly planar. And I say, well, OK, look, it is slightly puckered. That is, we can imagine it being a little concave downwards, like my hand is. Okay? When the oxygen binds, and we see oxygen bound over here, there is a very, very tiny change. So instead of being slightly puckered, it flattens a bit. Why does that happen? It happens because the oxygen pulls up the iron atom. The iron atom physically gets lifted. All right? Now, this change is minuscule. We're talking fractions of angstroms. Very, very tiny change. Yes, sir? Is this just the heme group that's getting moved? Kind of His question is, is this just the heme group? It turns out this movement affects a lot of things. So it's a very good question. But for the moment, we're thinking only about the iron atom. The heme group itself is not moving. It's the, it's the iron atom that's moving. So the iron atom moves up a very tiny fraction of an angstrom. And if you look at this structure, you'll notice that that iron atom is not floating freely there. It is, in fact, attached to an amino acid beneath it. This amino acid that it's attached to is a histidine. OK? Now, if I pull up on iron, and iron's attached to histidine, you can do the math and figure that, hey, the histidine is probably moving a fraction of an angstrom as well. And you'd be exactly right. And then you say, well, that histidine is attached to another amino acid in the protein. Is it moving also? Yep. So the foot bone, the toe bone's connected to the foot bone, and the foot bone's, this is not going to be a song, by the way. The foot bone's connected to the ankle bone, and the ankle bone's connected to the shin bone. And by pulling on the toe, I'm ultimately going to affect the hip even if it's by a very tiny amount. And this very tiny amount, okay, I can't emphasize enough the importance of this very tiny change because I'm going to hopefully convince you by the end that re the result of this very tiny amount of movement allows us to be animals. Without this movement, animal life essentially is not possible. Now, this is a scary thought. Okay? All right, so why is it that this makes animal life possible? Okay, we'll talk about that. Hemoglobin, of course, doesn't exist as a single subunit. It exists as four subunits. All four subunits have a, each, each subunit of the four has a heme group of its own. So when this guy binds an oxygen, okay, and by the way, they're not sh because it's a schematic, they're not showing the connection, but in each case it's connected to a histidine. When this guy binds an oxygen, let's say I've got this hemoglobin and it's got no oxygen in it whatsoever. This guy binds an oxygen. It's going to cause that iron atom to move a slight distance. It's going to cause that histidine to move a slight distance. It's going to cause that entire chain to very slightly shift. 
that very slight shift changes the overall shape of this subunit. And guess what? That shift affects how it interacts with its, its adjacent subunits. And the adjacent subunit now becomes more favorable for binding oxygen. So this one, you know, when we have hemoglobin that's empty of oxygen, it's not real keen on binding oxygen. But once one of them binds oxygen, these changes get communicated between the subunits, and each additional oxygen is increasingly favored for binding. This phenomenon I just described to you is called cooperativity. The binding of one molecule to a protein affecting the binding of others. In this case, it's positive cooperativity. It's favoring more binding. Now, this is really important. We have to, we are animals, we are moving creatures. We have to have an adequate oxygen supply. Plants don't have this issue. Plants don't have to get up and run around and jump and go chase things or run away from things. Their oxygen needs are more constant. Ours are rapidly changing. We need oxygen, we need it now. When our hemoglobin gets to our lungs, it doesn't have an awful lot of time to be there. We want it to load up on oxygen as much as it can and take that oxygen out to the tissues where it's needed. Cooperativity, as we will see, plays a very, very big role in loading up hemoglobin. So we're loading up hemoglobin. If we can't load up hemoglobin, we don't have enough oxygen. We can't go run. We can't go escape. We can't do things that animals do. All right. So very, very important. The other thing I want you to look at in this structure it's actually easier to see right here, is that when we look at hemoglobin from above, as we are uh, in this case, we see that hemoglobin is shaped sort of like a donut. And there's a little hole in the middle. That little hole turns out to be extremely important. Extremely important. So I'm going to come back and talk about that hole. But before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about the, the needs of oxygen in the cell and how hemoglobin helps to supply those. Questions on this before I move forward? Everybody understands what cooperativity is? Yes, sir? Does the inverse also occur when it unbinds oh, the oxygen? Good question. Does the inverse occur when it unbinds oxygen? The answer is to some extent, yes, it does. Loss of one will favor a loss, loss of additional ones. Yes. So it would be a negative cooperativity, right? OK. So you start to see where this is headed, right? All right. OK. Um, if we look at the oxygen binding of myoglobin, this is a plot. And again, whenever, whenever I show you a plot, I always want you to know what the axes tell us, because without the axes, the plot has no meaning. This is the fractional saturation, meaning what fraction of all of the myoglobin molecules in solution have an oxygen bound to them. Oxy myoglobin can only bind one oxygen per, per protein, because there's only one subunit, and each heme only binds one oxygen. All right? Either it's bound or it's not bound. So what percentage of those guys are bound with oxygen? Okay. Well, we see that it takes very little oxygen. This is very low. These, this is the pressure of oxygen on the x-axis. Very, very little oxygen for us to get 50% saturated. What does that mean? It means that myoglobin, when it has the chance, is grabbing a hold of oxygen. It's very good at storing oxygen. It, it grabs it, it holds on to it very well. Well, that's nice, but it's not ideal for delivering oxygen because if myoglobin didn't give up its oxygen until the oxygen concentration got very low, it could travel all the way through the body and get back to the lungs and it hasn't given up its oxygen. No, it's mine. I'm the big kid. I get the quarter. Right? I'm not going to give this up for you. Myoglobin only gives up its oxygen when the oxygen concentration gets very low. How many people have a UPS on their computer? Anybody know what a UPS is? It's an uninterruptible power supply. It's there to give you power when the power goes off so that you have a chance to shut down and save your work. Myoglobin is a UPS for your muscles. When you're working very hard, it's very easy for you to use oxygen faster than your blood can deliver it. Well, oxygen is important. It's not essential, but it's important 
And so the more oxygen that muscles have, the better off they are because muscles need it for contracting. We've got to run away from something. We've got to beat somebody up. We've got to do whatever, right? Hopefully we're not doing too much of that. If hemoglobin can't supply all the oxygen that's needed, we want something there to back it up, and this is backing it up. When the oxygen concentration starts getting very low, myoglobin says, oh, here's some oxygen. That's the only time that myoglobin really gives up oxygen is when the oxygen concentration gets very, very low. But it helps us when we need that. Let's compare that with hemoglobin. What was the That's the oxygen concentration. Oh, oh here? Yeah. How much does it take to get half of it, half of it uh, saturated, half of it bound to oxygen? Yeah. So P1 half just refers to 50% of it being bound. Okay. So very, very low number there. <laughs> if we compare this with hemoglobin, okay, hemoglobin has a different looking curve. So the curve that corresponds to myoglobin is what we call hyperbolic. It's a hyperbolic curve. It's a hyperbolic function that will fit that curve. The curve that hemoglobin gives is called sigmoidal because it has sort of an S shape. It's sigmoidal. Okay? Now, look at this. At low oxygen concentrations, there's not very much oxygen bound. When hemoglobin travels through our body, it goes from places of high oxygen concentration, our lungs, at high oxygen concentrations, essentially 100% of it gets bound with oxygen. As it travels through the body, the oxygen concentration starts dropping because the cells are using oxygen and hemoglobin is the only source. Oxygen concentration drops and hemoglobin starts letting go of its oxygen. It's a perfect system for delivery. We see it cooperatively binding oxygen to begin with, and we see cooperatively letting go of oxygen, that is binding in a negative sense, when the oxygen concentration starts to fall. Hemoglobin, because of cooperativity, can satisfy an immense uh, or a diverse set of oxygen concentrations as they occur in our bodies. This is essential for an animal. I just can't, I keep coming back to that, but I can't emphasize that enough. Okay? It binds like myoglobin at the very highest concentrations. It'll get 100% bound, but as oxygen concentration falls, it's down over here. Now that's pretty cool. Then by the time it's dumped its oxygen, it goes back to the lungs and it gets more oxygen. Okay, so let's uh, think about that a little bit. No, I'm not going to ask you to draw this particular figure, although you should be familiar with any of these figures that I'm doing. Okay? Um, we see the differences in oxygen concentration. And this figure is a little bit nice in that it shows us the concentration of oxygen roughly that occurs in tissues and the concentration of oxygen that roughly occurs in lungs. <coughs> we see that, again, way up here in the concentration in the lungs, myoglobin and hemoglobin are essentially the same. And then way out over here, when this thing gets out to the tissues, only, what is it, 38%, no, um, I'm sorry, what is this, about 30% or so uh, of the hemoglobin is actually still bound to oxygen, right? So that flexibility of hemoglobin for oxygen is very, very valuable for us and allows us to do things like sitting here or getting up and running if we have to go running, okay? And both of those work. If I exercise, blah, blah, blah. If I rest, I have different needs. If I have lungs, same sort of thing. Okay. Now, this shows us the, uh, the, the quaternary changes that happen as a result of oxygen binding to hemoglobin. Okay? Quaternary changes, meaning the four subunits are actually changing on oxygen binding. Notice that donut hole that I had before. The donut hole has largely closed up. Well, it turns out that these two different states of hemoglobin have names that we give, and we're going to hear more about these names later. They're called the R state and the T state. And I need to define them for you. So the one on the left that you see is called the T state, and T stands for tight. I like to think about it as people I know who are uptight. Right? People you know who are uptight, you can just sense it around them, right? And they, they can't take anything more, right? They're very rigid, okay? 
Give me some oxygen. No, I don't want any oxygen. Okay. So tight structures. What's that? The left? Yeah. That's tight. Yeah. Okay. They're not very flexible. They have poor binding of oxygen. So when hemoglobin has no oxygen, it's in the, it's in the T state. It doesn't want to bind more oxygen. On the other hand, once it's bound and it's gotten full of oxygen, its structure changes to what we call the R state. And R is the relaxed state. Okay? The relaxed state, yeah, come on, right? We'll take this, we'll handle it. I can take a lot of stuff, man. Right? I grew up in the 60s, guys. Come on, you've got you to give me credit for the language at least, right? All right? So the relaxed state is a high affinity binding for oxygen. Once we put one oxygen on there, we, we, we start flipping it into the R state, and we've got more affinity to bind more oxygen. We flip it into the T state, it doesn't want to bind oxygen. That's kind of good. If you think about it, let's imagine that I'm a hemoglobin that's floating around, and I've just gone to, uh, let's say, the muscles, where they're exercising pretty heavily, and I dump all my oxygen. On the way back to the heart, or to the lungs, I pass through the kidney. Do I want the hemoglobin taking the oxygen away from the kidney? That wouldn't be a good career move, right? So I only want it to flip when it, there's a high oxygen concentration, and that's what's going to happen when it gets back in the lungs. So this T state, R state, really serves the body's needs very, very usefully. Now, <coughs> there are a couple of ways of describing how this phenomenon occurs. And the way I've described it to you is what's called a sequential means. That is, the binding of the first one affects the second one, affects the third one, affects the fourth one. If, and it's not shown on the screen, this is a different model, but if I were to describe what happens, we've got T state above, we've got R state below. In a sequential model, one of these guys turns circular. It favors the next one turning circular, the next one turning circular, the next one turning circular, etc. That model is called a sequential model of binding. Changes in the structure of one changes the next one, which changes the next one, which changes the next one. It's sequential. This model that you see on the screen is the opposite of the sequential. It's called the, um, the um, concerted, I can't pull it out, the concerted model. And all this says, this model says, and these are models. Models are ways of explaining things. Okay? <coughs> this model says that we don't see one followed by the other, followed by the other, followed by the other. Instead, what we see is we're either in one state or we're in the other state, and binding of things locks them into that state. Now, hemoglobin is not a good model for this. We'll see in next week's lecture how an enzyme is much better of a model for this. But this model, and I'll say more about this model next week, so I'm not going to go into it much here, but this model says that the changes happen all at once, and they're independent of the binding of anything. We see this is going back and forth, back and forth. But they get locked into one versus the other based on what they bind. So we'll come back to that next time. For right now, think sequential. Binding of the first changes the second, changes the third, changes the fourth. OK. Changing the T to R uh, state changes significantly the binding affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen, which is what I showed you before. And if we look at what hemoglobin would look like in the T state, this is what it would look like. If it were only in the R state, this is what it would look like. And in fact, hemoglobin goes through a transition from T to R. And that's what we're seeing why this curve has a couple of shapes in it. We're seeing a change from T to R. So that change is what we've already described as cooperativity. And that cooperativity is favoring binding, in this case, of additional oxygen if we're getting more oxygen, or favoring the release of oxygen if we're getting into lower concentrations of oxygen. OK. Now, there's, um, here's, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you had the sequential. There's the sequ this is what the sequential looks like. So nothing bound. First one changes this one, which causes this one to change, which binds, which causes this one to change, which binds, which causes this one to bang, change, which binds. It doesn't matter if it binds to an alpha subunit or a beta subunit. It doesn't matter. They're essentially the same as far as this uh, molecule exists. Yes, sir? Shouldn't the arrows under K4 be switched to where there's a higher affinity to drive it further to the right? Uh, it, all these depend on oxygen concentration. So you, you, you are exactly right. 
So in the, in the concentration of the lungs, even though you've got a lower going to the right, there's enough oxygen concentration to drive that. You're showing a sequential increase in K1 and K2 on the top arrow, and the last one is shorter. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's counterintuitive. Uh, no, because it doesn't want to bind that first one. Right? I agree, that this is, but this is important for releasing of oxygen. So you're actually, this, uh, from what I've told you, sounds a little odd in terms of putting that last one on there, right? But this is, the reason this is this case is because that first one doesn't want to bind. Yeah. And that's because this guy here is in the T state. That's your answer to your question. I mean, once you have the three on there, it seems like it should be more of a push in the equilibrium to put the fourth one on there. Right. And so his point is that this equilibrium is favored actually in the leftward direction. And that would be true if we weren't in the high oxygen concentrations of the lungs. So lungs are loaded with oxygen, and that drives it to, into this state. We want this guy to dump off oxygen once it gets out of the lungs. So that's why that, that, that arrow is back to the left. OK, so let's see. Where am I at here? Now, OK, so that's the basics of hemoglobin. But there's so much more that's built into this molecule. The first one I'm going to show you right here is a really interesting and cool molecule called 2,3-BPG. We'll talk more about this molecule later in the term when I talk about glycolysis. But this molecule turns out to be a fascinating molecule. You don't need to know the structure, but you definitely need, need to know at least this part of the name, 2,3-BPG. Its real name is 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. I need to tell you why this molecule is important. If my microphone will work, that is. Why this molecule is important. This molecule is a molecule that is released by rapidly respiring cells. If I'm a muscle cell and I'm doing my business, I'm making 2,3-BPG. We'll see later it's actually a byproduct, but that doesn't matter for our purposes right now. Actively respiring cells release 2,3-BPG. Okay? So my muscle cells may have a lot of 2,3-BPG. My nose cells may not have so many. Okay? With me? Unless I'm sneezing. I've got that cold. Everybody else does. I might have more 2,3-BPG. Now, it turns out that 2,3-BPG affects hemoglobin. If we look at hemoglobin in the presence of 2,3-BPG in red, we see that it binds less. And they're not exaggerating the S so much here. So they've, they've sort of drawn this to make their point. But the point is that with, in the presence of 2,3-BPG, hemoglobin holds on to less oxygen. So 2,3-BPG, it turns out, causes the hemoglobin to release oxygen. How does it do it? It's very simple. 2,3-BPG has a shape that fits exactly in that donut. It fits exactly in that donut. And when it fits into the donut, it favors the conversion of hemoglobin from the R state to the T state. T state has low affinity for oxygen. Guess what hemoglobin is going to do when 2,3-BPG starts to bind to it? It's going to start giving up more oxygen. And that's exactly what this curve is telling us. Now, this turns out from a, from a bodily perspective to be very useful. Because when I've got actively respiring tissue and I've got a lot of 2,3-BPG, what's 2,3-BPG going to do? It's going to bind to hemoglobin. And hemoglobin says, oh, flip into the T state. I let go of oxygen. And as a consequence of letting go of that oxygen, the tissues that need the oxygen get it. That's great. But wait, there's more. All right? But wait, if hemoglobin has bound to 2,3-BPG, it's going to be in the T state. And when it gets back to the lungs, it's still got 2,3-BPG. It doesn't, it doesn't want to bind more oxygen. I've got trouble. Well, fortunately, remember these are not covalent bindings. Fortunately, 2,3-BPG fits in that pocket, but it goes in, it comes out, goes in, comes out. Like any binding occurs, these binding and letting go happen all the time. On the way back to the lungs, 2,3-BPG, when it gets off of hemoglobin, can be grabbed by cells and metabolized by them. So that as hemoglobin is making its way back to cells in most people, the cells are grabbing it, burning it up, and the hemoglobin gets back to the lungs, and it has no 2,3-BPG in it. If it had 2,3-BPG in it, you wouldn't bind as much oxygen. Now, all of you pre-meds, 
Everybody looks up at that point. Smokers are full of 2,3-BPG. Smokers are full of 2,3-BPG. The reason that's one of the reasons that smokers huff and puff going upstairs is that 2,3-BPG doesn't get all the way broken down. The hemoglobin gets back to the lungs. Uh-oh. My oxygen carrying capacity is lower. That's why smokers huff and puff going upstairs. They've got too much 2,3-BPG. Now, the next question is, why do they have more? And that we will save and talk about when we talk about glycolysis. Suffice it to say, they have much more 2,3-BPG in their blood than do non-smokers. Yes, sir? So is that a large contributory factor to something like COPD? COPD being? Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, is it, oh, is it, is it a contributor to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Not to my knowledge. Uh, there are other things that give rise to that. Uh, but um, I, I'm not a medical person, so I can't tell you that. But suffice it to say that the primary uh, physical observation that you can make with respect to hemoglobin, uh, and, with respect to the BBG in smokers, is that they huff and puff. They puff and then they really huff and puff, right? Okay, so if you smoke, quit doing it, right? Now you know at the molecular basis why smokers are having a hard time going upstairs, okay? Their hemoglobin is stuck in the T state, and they can't get it out of that T state very well. Okay. There we go. There's your donut, and there's the binding. And we don't need to worry about all the various other stuff that's here. All right. Now, hemoglobin's some pretty cool stuff. There's a problem, though, okay? We are not chickens. And some would say that's probably good, okay? But chickens lay eggs, and the fetus that develops inside of an egg um, has its own resources and uh, doesn't have to rely on mom, except at the point where the egg is laid. Mom, however, is the source of nutrients in mammals for uh, food, for water, and for oxygen. Now, there's a problem. The problem is, what if... Uh, Mom's hemoglobin is competing with the baby's hemoglobin. They both have oxygen. Why should the baby's hemoglobin, you know, um, uh, have to fight with mom for that? Okay. Well, it turns out that fetuses have a modified hemoglobin. They have a different hemoglobin than, than adults do. They have something called fetal hemoglobin. Adults have alpha 2, beta 2, meaning we have two alpha subunits, two beta subunits, and that makes that four subunit thing that you saw. A fetus, on the other hand, okay, has two alpha subunits and two slightly different gamma subunits. Okay? So they've got alpha 2, gamma 2. Those two gamma subunits give the hemoglobin of a fetus a very, I shouldn't say very, but a slightly different property than mom's. Do they have cooperativity? Yes. But they have a greater affinity for oxygen than mom's hemoglobin. They can literally take oxygen away from mom. Talk about a little parasite, right? A little parasite sitting there sucking my oxygen, right? How do they do it? Well, the gamma subunits, in addition to having a slightly different structure, cause the hemoglobin that they're in to not have a donut. That little donut hole where the 2,3-BPG fit doesn't fit 2,3-BPG anymore. The fetal hemoglobin essentially stays in the R state all the time. Essentially stays in the R state all the time. Now, you say, oh, that's great. So obviously it can take oxygen away from mom, and yes, it can, and yes, it does. But we, uh, we just saw how the T state helped to release oxygen, right? Is the fetus starved for oxygen? What do you think? No? Okay. There's a no. There's a no. Nobody thinks yes? Okay. No, it's not. Why? Why is it not starved for oxygen? Higher net oxygenation level? Higher net oxygenation level. Uh, it does have a higher net oxygenation level, but it also has trouble releasing oxygen. So uh, the answer is no. The answer is simpler than you think. Connie? Okay, 
And that's the answer. Okay? It just sits there. It doesn't have widely varying oxygen needs. Mom goes and climbs the stairs. She needs more oxygen than when she's sitting around in a chair. All the fetus does is kick. Okay? So it doesn't have widely varying oxygen needs. It needs a relatively constant supply of oxygen. And because it does have a higher oxygen carrying capacity, as you noted, okay, then there's enough released that it can satisfy those needs. If it had very, very diverse and very challenging needs, then you betcha there would be uh, an issue. Okay. Other questions? Um, I'm going through this kind of quickly. Shen? So if you're like a mom um, and maybe like you had history of low blood concentration, like iron concentration, would it be smart for you to take supplements for that? If you were a mom and you had anemia, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, would it be smart for mom to take, uh, I don't know, iron supplements or something like that? Yeah, for people who are anemic, that can be a, a consideration uh, with mom. And I'm not, a, again, not a physician, but I would imagine that, yes, they would do just that. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so when the fetus is born, it's got fetal hemoglobin. So that change over happens over about the first year or two where the gamma subunits stop being made, okay? And the beta subunits start being made. And so the fetus transitions to adult hemoglobin fairly early in its life. But you're exactly right. Yeah. Yes. Does it change on, based on how active the baby is? You know, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, as far as I know, it's simply a, a developmental thing. Your question is whether it responds to environment, and I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Okay, well, we've gone through a lot. I thought we'd finish with a song today. What do you guys think? We haven't done a song in a while. I have a cold, so my singing would be worse than usual, so I want you to sing really loud today. And by the way, I have a deal I, I do with my classes. If you guys sing loud, I can assure you we'll have an extra credit question on the exam. But if I can't hear you, everybody ready? Okay. Everybody sing. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser. I feel I'm in way over my head. I need a new advisor. My courses really shouldn't be such metabolic misery. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser. Biochemistry, biochemistry, reactions make me shiver. They're in my heart and in my lungs. They're even in my liver. I promise I would not complain if I could store them in my brain. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I'm truly in a panic. The mechanisms murder me. I should have learned organic. For all I have to memorize, I ought to win the Nobel Prize. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser. All right, guys. See you Friday. Yeah. So he is, he is weird. He is weird. He has 20